So, I, so the question that I saw was off the back of the Airbnb topics that we discussed. Um, now, at, at that time, there was a whole conversation around whether uh, body corporates can restrict or restrain um, an owner uh, of a sectional scheme or a unit from a short uh, from renting on a short term basis. Now, this this obviously was centered around the Airbnb model, where somebody would buy a, a a unit in a complex and they would try Airbnb it out. And you obviously find this very very popular in like your Durban and Schlange areas where that's what you actually do. Um, a lot of the times it's really beautiful buildings with views and you try Airbnb, Airbnb them out. So a lot of the times you'd actually buy the property with this intention. So one, our, our viewer saw this video, but she asked the question, but it, it kind of throws a curveball because it's different. So now we're not complaining about body corporates being restrictive or, or obstructive. We're now asking the question on whether landlords can do this. And from the stance of the question, it was if a landlord that owns the building uh, rents it out to me and I do short-term Airbnb or I'd like to do short-term Airbnb. Unfortunately, the question wasn't specific on whether they had been doing it or they were just planning on doing it. But the building also has a hotel as a tenant. Um, and this hotel is obviously running the business of a hotel. Um, and, can, is, and basically the question was, is there a workaround that kind of allows this person, this client or this viewer to run an Airbnb or short-term letting um, if the landlord says that they can't simply because the hotel is putting pressure on the landlord or the hotel is putting pressure on the tenant. So, so, it's, so this is such a loaded question because there's different aspects that we need to look at here. Um, for, uh, for starters, you're looking at your leasing model um, and whether a person is actually allowed to sublet because that's what, you, what, what you'd be doing. If you don't own the property and you're letting it from a landlord and now you want to sublet it to somebody else and it's a residential property, we start asking the question now of whether you as a tenant can actually sublet, whether the landlord allows this uh, to take place, which typically is not the case. Um, most lease agreements would say it would restrict who occupies the property, let alone like actually sublet it out. Um, and what we tend to find is that people that want to enter into rent to rent agreements, and that's what we call it, is where you rent from a landlord in order to rent to somebody else, especially with the Airbnb model where you might not have the funding to buy the property. Typically, in those instances, you want to make sure that your contract is airtight because a lot of money goes behind investing in Airbnb. Um, you know, there's a lot of furnishings, a lot of things particular to that area. So the last thing you'd want is to invest so much in the property. And then all of a sudden, uh, the landlord terminates or says you're in breach or something happens, tries to get out of it because he's selling the property. So this is an investment. It's a business transaction. So you want to make sure that the contract is right. So that's the first thing that we need to ask is what does the lease say? Because if the landlord allows for it in the lease because you negotiated with it prior, then there's nothing he can do now that's going to stop you from doing it. So you've got right set in stone. Um, even if he's got a different agreement with the hotel that restricts it, your rights are still in place. So that's the first thing that we need to look at um, from, from a contractual perspective. Now, what's very interesting is from a commercial perspective, and there's recent case law on this uh, regarding restrictive um, restrictive terms when it comes to commercial lease agreements, especially in shopping centers with exclusivity, where anchor tenants were using their bargaining power to restrict what um, type of tenant um, the landlord could actually get into the shopping center. And this to me sounds very similar to this because at the end of the day, the Airbnb is for all intents and purposes, a business. Um, I mean, SARS seems to consider it as a business insofar as VAT is concerned. And so does, um, and the hotel is a business. 
so, I mean, again, we don't know what the lease looks like, but if this is actually with commercial intent, um, we have to ask the question on fairness uh, and competitive, uh, competitive behavior, whether anchor tenant is actually allowed to restrict other people from competing with it. And the, 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 uh, the court found that um, it's not fair. It's not, it's not in the spirit of competitive behavior and that um, those sort of provisions were, if I recall correctly, it was contra bono moris. So, it's just interesting. So to answer the question twofold, the lease says a lot, yes, but there is an element of fairness when it comes to restrictive trade practices. Um, but that is obviously presumed on whether your lease is actually a residential lease or not, because if it was intended to be a residential lease, then you can't really force the landlord to make it a rent to rent so you can run your business from there. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I think that that kind of covers it. And I, I agree with you 100%. Actually, uh, I wanted to bring in the commercial lease agreement aspect, which you did perfectly. Anyway, I wanted to mention that on commercial properties, we see it often uh, a restrictive. I once had a case, I think it must have been about six years ago, while vaping wasn't a, a big thing yet. And there were mm -hmm. limited um, vaping situations. And I, I won't uh, they mentioned the, the chain's name, but there was a very big chain that sold um, Twisp. Remember when Twisp was like mm. one of the first e-cigarette vaping devices? Mm. Whatever. And this chain said they are going to pull out of this center and out of every center that this landlord owns, unless they, um, uh, I think Evolution Vape was the... Uh, the company that just had like a little uh, pop-up stand and they said they're going to pull their shops from this landlord's malls and it's a sure. very big chain chain um, unless they uh, they remove that pop-up shop and it was sure. a pretty big fight and essentially our argument was on behalf of the landlord but this is an anti-competitive behavior you can't as this big massive chain come in on a smaller and at that time evolution vape was still a very small upcoming thing. I mean, currently you see evolution vape shops in pretty much every mall and they're pretty big shops and, and they're clearly performing very well. So well done mm. evolution vape. I'm, I'm very impressed with what you guys are doing, but um, on, on the way they're building their business, I don't like vaping, sure. but um, <laughs> that's, um, so that's a very, um, that was a very interesting thing. And I know this happens. And especially if this is a bigger hotel group, I suppose they can easily intimidate a landlord yeah. to feel, oh my goodness, I have to please these guys because they might just um, mm. move their Pack business and somewhere leave. else. And the truth is, luckily, we do have this case law. Mm. So that's mm. what I wanted to mention. Um, but so I think, I've, I think we've, we've covered that one completely. The only other comment that I wanted to make is what, if you buy a property, let's stick. It, it seems like tonight's theme is Airbnb. This is now what happened. So, what I wanted to mention is, um, if you buy a property with the intention to look at me now, framing my own question. <laughs> if you buy, <laughs> if you buy a property with the sole intention to use it as an Airbnb, what happens if prior to transfer? The body corporate makes a decision, brings out a conduct rule that says you are not allowed to Airbnb in this place. Now, I've, I know you and I've had these conversations and we've had so many questions on this, but I think it's such an important one because we've had that actually a property uh, in Cape Town. It must have been then like Clifton or, or Constantia or one of those places where our client bought this investment property for 21 million rand. It's a complex with only six um, properties at the complex, obviously residential properties. And our client bought that property with the exclusive intention of Airbnb it out. And unfortunately for our client, what happened is he bought the property, property transferred. Then there was a special general meeting, which he did not mm. attend. Mm. They changed the conduct rules. So they, they called the SGM in terms of the, of the management rules. They've done it correctly. Outline did not attend. 
and the majority owners. And it is only six courses. So look at me now coming back to my binge watching survivor. Eh? So when you sit with six, you need an alliance <laughs> of sure. more than three. I know these things now. I'm clever. I learned so much from survivor. <laughs> so unfortunately, they didn't have uh, the, yeah. I think his vote would actually have been the vote that swings the thing. And the rules were he adopted and yeah. he wasted 21 mm. million rand. Now, I've bought stuff some in, in my life sometimes that I think, oh, oh, this is not actually ideal. But it's not easily 21 million sure. rand that you're like, sure. oh, hiffy, now what? And now you have to sell. Mm. And, and currently, especially in Cape Town, um, in, in that market, a 21 million rand property um, isn't going to sell that well. And um, yeah, so that's very sad. And, and unfortunately, I think a lot of owners in sectional title complexes doesn't know that if something is tabled, you can actually really put up a proper fight because that's the time to do it when the, when the issue is raised. Mm. And we're talking yeah. about the conduct rules. Uh, come in and say why it is a problem. Why do you want to do this? Why it wouldn't be a security risk? Which steps would you take as the owner to protect the other owners? What would you do to ensure that these people aren't loud and uh, rowdy and stuff? What will you do to achieve that? And sure. maybe you can swing a vote. Have you had, have you ever seen the other way around? Uh, uh, what I mean is, have you ever had a client who bought into a complex where they weren't allowed to Airbnb and were successful in approaching the body corporate and changing the rule to allow it? Have you ever had that? Uh, I'll be honest, it's it's never happened because I think most of the guys go in with the intention, so they feel it might be a bit of a risk um, if, if it's not already allowed. But I mean, I can imagine maybe even a current owner that's been living there for 20 years suddenly wants to move to another city and goes, oh, what do I do with this property? Let me Airbnb it. Wait, it's not allowed? Um, you know, let me push for a resolution uh, to allow it. So I, I can see it happening. It's definitely a practical example. Would you say you can approach a court to compel a body corporate to, to allow it? I don't think so. So if you look at that recent case that we discussed the last time, that speaks of the democracy within a body corporate, as it were, and the fact that you sign in and you give up certain rights um, and you, you almost govern almost, almost like it is a government, right? And it's it governed in terms of rules and you abide by these rules. And if the body corporate is designed or uh, is designed to, for example, uh, focus on lifestyle and relaxation and, you know, that sort of thing. Like it's got a certain purpose behind it. The court's attitude was each case needs to be considered under its own circumstance. So that's the first thing. And I said it the last time, the case does not say that under all circumstances, um, people can say no to short-term letting in the body corporate. But the court did consider what the scheme was about, what the intention was, why the owners were in the scheme to begin with. And if a lot of the owners were there because they wanted peace, quiet, they don't want strangers, they wanted a small little community, the court would actually consider that as a reason why the majority voted against Airbnb, because there's an actual purpose, a justifiable purpose, as it were, versus... Um, like, for example, if this thing was built for holidays, uh, one could very easily argue that, sure, the only reason you'd buy this thing is to put people in it during the holiday. Um, but I don't think you'd be able to compel. I think you may be able to maybe turn a vote that goes against you. Um, but yeah, it's a difficult one. I think if it doesn't exist, you probably wouldn't be able to force it uh, because it's not necessarily, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's strange. It is prohibitive, so maybe you could still argue that there's no rationale behind it, and you could mm -hmm. maybe set aside that rule if it does exist. Um, I don't think you need to compel the body corporate to say yes, but you might be able to overturn a decision of no, if, if that makes sense. I agree. Yeah. I, I agree with you 100%. I wonder, I, I, I'm really desperate. I can't believe we don't have more case law yet mm. around that, because I, I, my personal feeling, and I've, I've said this on quite a few occasions and quite publicly, I think it's quite silly for a body corporate to, as a result of 
fear, make a fear-driven decision not to allow Airbnb because, I mean, you know, I've had a levy collection department in SSLR for, for quite some time. And every time you see the body corporates that suffer, one of the things that pull a body corporate out of a levy crisis is allowing Airbnb because Absolutely. your Airbnb investors yeah. Are mm. the guys who pay the levies pretty properly? Absolutely. No, absolutely. So I I do not understand. Um, I mean, no. I do understand the, a fear decision. I do. I must say personally, I think it was very yeah. unfortunate because unfortunately, this pushing the rule of not allowing Airbnb does come from uh, managing agents and attorneys sure. more yeah. than from from the yeah. owner occupant. Absolutely. Um, so that's very unfortunate. And look, and what would actually be quite nice, I suppose if we had the time, it would be really great to actually put together a protocol that you could take to body corporates because it is right. It's misinformation. It's fear. We deal with Airbnb all the time and we deal with normal leases. So for me, I would much rather uh, like have a tenant that Airbnbs because I know the, the, strict, uh, the strict requirements, the, you know, the rating system, the, the vetting beforehand, all of this that actually gets put in place versus a tenant where sometimes the vetting is not that great because it's subjective. And once the guy stays there for long periods of time, he starts taking things for granted. He starts fighting with the neighbors. I mean, people get on each other's nerves one way or another. A, a guy could be the most unfriendliest guy, but he goes Airbnbs for one night and gets out. The likeness of him getting to a fight versus a long-term tenant um it's it's exactly that so i actually find the airbnb is a great way of limiting risk but the problem isn't with airbnb it's short-term letting and we're using airbnb as a type of a verb you go oh i'm going to airbnb it out but airbnb is a specific platform with specific rules with super hosts and vetting processes but short-term letting is not i mean there's places that rent rooms for an hour a day. Um, you, you understand that's short-term letting too. Um, yes. And there, there you but that's be usually not for occupy, uh, for, you know, you don't really occupy for a long time. It's not accommodation sure. per se, is it? <laughs> Unless you say, but, but, but you get the point, but that's exactly it. And that's where people yes. are like, who's being let in? If there's a protocol saying, what if you adopt this into the rules and it, it favors everyone. And it's a set protocol that you can just kind of like run through CSOS. They go, well, it's reasonable. And you actually go into body corporates and say, plug this in, plug this in, plug this in. That's very clever because I think what a lot of people also don't know is in the context of a short-term rental, specifically Airbnb, those kind of short-term holiday or business days, the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act will not apply when you do sure. that eviction. And sure. the reason for that is obviously because um, somebody by definition has another place sure. to stay. Sure. And you sure. record that on the app and everywhere. Everybody knows what your actual address is. So when we need to do that eviction, it's a commercial eviction, four sure. to six weeks done. And I wonder if body corporates uh, consider that, that yeah. in making their decisions. Yeah. And, and even um, uh, investors. Um, sure that might think, oh, but it's risky to Airbnb, um, sure. where in fact, I mean, you, you cut out the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act and your eviction sure. software. Get, I'm personally a very big airbnb -er. Uh When I yeah. travel, I hate staying in hotels. It grosses me out on a whole new level. I love an Airbnb. It feels like I'm at home. Somebody else is home, but at least it feels like I'm at home. And sure. it's pleasant and nice. And I must say, I've never been in an airbnb um, where I feel like, oh, yes, um, if I was a different person, this could go, uh, you know, yeah. really, um, yeah. it's not like, but maybe I'm just a good yeah. occupant. So I thought, let me throw in the bias thing on, sure. on Airbnb. Sure. No, look, it makes a lot of sense. Maybe it's a conversation we should also have off air, because I think there's a lot of value we could probably add if we did do something like that yeah. um, and distribute to the industry. So any viewers that would be interested. I suppose the problem is it comes down to time and funding because a lot of the stuff, and this is why I find there isn't case law on this, is because you get approached by a single Airbnb owner complaining that according to the rules, their levies are doubled. 
uh, or not levy, sorry, their penalties are doubled if something goes wrong. And you're like, okay, great, we can fight it by doing A, B, and C. But sometimes they go, well, you know, it's cheaper to pay the penalty sometimes than it is to pay an attorney to go fight it. So what's the point? And then to try and get all these people together is a mission in itself. So it would actually be interesting to get a group of people that goes, we are Airbnb enthusiasts. We would be willing to actually put retainers together, you know, like a little association that goes out and actually does things like this, you know, creates uh, protocols, you know, takes case law on. So it would actually be nice. So we should maybe have the conversation if there's any viewers that would actually be interested in this, like guys, come, let's do it. Like we can't start it for you. We can only actually pull the trigger. Like we need the people to come to us and say, come do it. So like get your friends, get your family, get everyone together and let's have that conversation. Let's yeah, call a meeting and discuss this. I like that. I like that. I think we can. And, and I think uh, most Airbnb hosts feel that they are so alone um, when it comes to the property industry. They're sort of there in their own little corner. But yeah, let's, let's, let's pull them in sure. and talk to us. Sure.